Hey, Sens fans, welcome to Season 3, Episode 24 of the Centennial Podcast. And this week, we're joined by a very special guest, uh, Tony Ferrari. Tony is an NHL draft analyst for the Hockey News and Sports Illustrated, and we're really excited to welcome Tony onto the show today. So, Tony, thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, no problem. Always happy to come on and talk hockey and talk prospects. Now, Matt and I, yeah, the double mats, uh, we're both prospect junkies, so uh, we're Really happy to get this chance to talk to you now. The I mean, being a, being a Senators fan, don't you have to be a prospect junkie at this point? We don't it's... get like <laughs> roster junkie yeah. ever. We, it's just consistent prospect junkie. Oh, you know, it's... with uh, Batherson and Kachuk, <laughs> though, uh, and Shabbat all getting long-term contracts, it, we can start to have the anxiety levels come down a little bit. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, the roster building part is very important to us. So uh, <laughs> the Sens stay put in the draft lottery. Uh, They're keeping the seventh overall pick and barring a trade, there's a lot of options to choose from a lot of guys in a similar tier around that, that spot. Um, So I was just kind of wondering what your thoughts were on who the Sens should pick in that range. And who do you think maybe could be a good compliment to a guy like Tim Stutzel in the top six down the road? Well, I think the Sens are in a really interesting position because as, as everyone in Sens land knows, Eugene Melnick passed away and rest in peace and everything like all that. But this is going to be kind of Pierre Dorian's first draft where he's not going to have that outside influence. And it's really, I thought it was convenient timing that they fired Pierre Maguire when they did, because he's not gonna have to worry about his outside influence either. We're going to get to see kind of Dorian go into this and go, I'm going to take this on myself. And it's going to be really interesting to see what route he goes. Does he go the Tyler Boucher route and, and go a little wild and, Grab a guy like, uh, I don't know if Connor Geeky would be as wild as as Tyler Boucher, but he's a guy that's fallen down the draft boards a little bit that seems like he would fit that that mold that the Sens have gone for in, in a couple of recent drafts. But I think there's a lot of really high-end, not, not high, high-end prospects, but there's a lot of really good players that they'll be able to choose from in the, at that seventh pick because this is a draft where after maybe one and two, and even two right now seems to be up in the air, one, two, and three, maybe, if we're going to be getting super generous, it's completely wide open from four till 20. Like, it's really crazy this year how many uh, variations there are in different different draft boards. Now, is there a guy in particular that you think that if the Sens went after, he'd be a good compliment down the road in the top six? Because this year, the biggest issue for Sens fans, I think, was who could fit in on the wing for Tim Stutzla? because Ottawa really hasn't filled that void yet. Yeah, there, there's a few players, and I think there's a lot of guys that could play wing or might play wing, but are listed as centers right now. Uh, you look at a guy like Frank Nazar and Matthew Savoy, both of them are listed as centers a lot of places. And on my board, I have them listed as center wingers, because as much as I believe they both have the traits to be a center at the next level, teams might look at them because they're undersized centers and go, ah, brain point only comes around once in a blue moon. So we're going to throw this guy on the wing and that's going to be where he plays. So I think either of those guys could be an excellent compliment. And I think Brad Lambert's the ultimate wild card though, because this guy's got all the tools in the world. I think you look at him and you go, man, him and Tim together. Oh boy. Would that be some fast, fun, high paced, high skilled hockey. And I think that's something that the sense can go for because I think the one thing I think we can all admit is, is we love Brady. I think he's one of the funnest players in the entire league to watch. Shabbat's a stud. Timmy's doing his thing. My light's going crazy right now <laughs> over in the corner. That was all right. Cool. That's just going to happen, I guess. <laughs> well, he's um, got a ghost in the house. <laughs> yeah, apparently. But uh, no, they have all these fun, fun players. And this, this Sens team has got this great personality and this great kind of bravado about them. But I don't know if they have the guy yet and maybe tim's that guy i think there that's a possibility but i think swinging on a guy like brad lambert swinging on a guy like matthew savoy in this situation could be really interesting because maybe that's their guy that that can truly be that super dynamic high producing offensive force because we would look at brady this year and like this was his first what i think first 60 point season or first 50 point season yeah so it's like i love brady i think he's a stud the dude is the heart and soul of this team but someone needs to put up points as well. So you look at, I mean, you go back to the Kings days when they had Dustin Brown as their captain and, and then they got Anze Kopitar and he's the guy that kind of put up those points and was did big things for them. So you can have a guy that like uh, Brady Kachuk as the captain and the leader and the star player on the team, but you need some point producers as well. Yeah, that's totally it's fair. A, 
it's an interesting uh, proposition having, you know, these guys like like Drake Batherson, you got Josh Norris, you got Tim Stutzla. And I think they all have very different ceilings when it comes to point production and, and what they're able to accomplish. I mean, you had said, you know, maybe Timmy's the guy. Like, I think unequivocally, Tim Stutzla is the guy. Like, he, I don't think has, there hasn't been a player with the the ability offensively since like Eric Carlson that played on this team that just like puts butts and seats here. Yeah. Um, and I think all of the noise with like the diving stuff, it's just, it's, oh. it's comical uh, <laughs> because, you know, it's just people taking stupid penalties and, you know, referees are calling it. Yeah. Did he go down easy? <laughs> Who cares? He still threw the penalty. Um, and then he goes and gets a power play point. Like by the end of the season, like he was just, he was in a monster on the power play because he drew it and then he got the point out of it. Um, I do really like the idea uh, of those three guys that you brought up because they're so polarizing with Frank Nazar, Matthew Savoy and Brad Lambert. They're all over the place. And it's, it's a weird draft for that um, because, you know, you don't really know if you're reaching or, or stealing or what. And, you know, speaking of reaches, uh, last year, Ottawa went off the board <laughs> by going for Tyler Boucher. Um, who in this year's draft could you possibly see Ottawa going for? Like, I know you had mentioned Connor Geeky, um, but it feels like he might not be so much of a, a reach because he's been so high on draft boards and, and where else, but like, is there a guy that, you know, will go high because of like his play style, but he shouldn't. There, there's a few guys that I could see going higher than they probably should. I think Tristan Leno is a guy like that. Who's I think going to be an NHL defenseman, but I don't know if he'll ever be much more than a third pairing defenseman. He's a guy that I think plays really low event hockey. Um, I kind of look at him and I go, do you like Martin Marincin? Great. That's what you're getting. Like, and, and it's not exactly the same thing. I think Leno has a more phys- physical game in general, but really there's not much there to really get excited about in terms of upside, but he's a surefire NHL or he's got good size, plays a physical game. and can definitely be that guy. I think Nathan Gaucher is another one from the queue, a uh, big physical center. Didn't really put up points this year. And when I watched games, there was a lot of people that were like, well, you're, you're going to see him do everything right. And that's always been my argument with a guy like Brad Lambert, Lucas Raymond, a few years ago, you're seeing the process there. So the points will come eventually. And when I went to watch Nathan Gaucher, that's what I was told. And I, I didn't really see it. He does a lot of things ro- really well, but I look at him more as a, a prototypical third line center. And you're pretty secure in, in what you're getting with him. I think with that. And I mean, we, we've all seen the Leafs do some dumb things in the draft and draft Freddie Goche because he was going to be a prototypical center in the first round. And look how good that worked out. So I don't think he's a guy I'd love to take in the first round, but if you can get him in the second, I think it's an excellent value. So I, I think kind of going similar to the, similar to the, with what Tyler Boucher got taken last year, most people had him in the fifties. I had him a little lower than that in the sixties, if I'm not mistaken, but late second round kind of was where everyone had him and him jumping up to the first round and in, in Ottawa's pick in the top 10, it was a little wild. It was a little crazy, but if there's anybody, I'd, I'd say it'd be Gaucher or, or uh, uh, Tra- uh, Tra- Leno. Now, moving away from forwards, there's two very notable defensemen in this draft, uh, both right-handed shots in Simone Nemich and David Yurchek. Now, they're anywhere from, like, I've seen some draft boards that have Yurchek at three, some have Nemich at three or four or maybe swap them out. Like one of them could be at seven and one's at three. So in your opinion, which of these two guys has the higher upside? Cause there doesn't really seem to be a consensus. Uh, for me, it's David Juracek. And I think it's because he just has a little bit more of the killer instinct in this game, I think. And that's the big difference between these two. I think Simon Nimich is this really dynamic defensive or offensive player, sorry, who, who, who puts up a lot of points and makes the right play and, and does a lot of things really, really well. He, makes some pretty fantastic passes in the breakout and skate the puck up ice. There's a lot to like in his game, but you look and you go, there feels like there's something missing. And then you watch David Juracek and he'll be at the blue line, walking along the blue line and then dart into the zone and, and make a nice play offensively. And he has that little bit of that killer instinct. 
in his game. And he also has a bit of a mean streak. David Yurichek was suspended a couple times last year, if I'm not mistaken, for for hits up high, cross checks to the face. That's something that Ottawa Senators fans would love, and they they right in on this team. So I, I think he's a guy that I think would really fit in well with those two be or with that team because he does bring so much of that physical game, so much of that aggression, so much of that just wanting to kind of create and in a guy like him on the power play would be really interesting because we, we see what Thomas Shabbat can do on the power play with some of his dynamic skating ability and some of the, the moves he makes to evade traffic and get himself in the space. And David Juracek does some of that as well. So it'd be really interesting to see kind of what he could do on a second power play unit with, with that mean streak on the defensive side of the puck too. He's got to work on some positioning and, and whatnot, but David Juracek be the guy I'd pick out of those two. And, but that's not, not to say Timo Nemec is a bad player either. For sure. It's it's just one of those drafts, you know. <laughs> it it feels like there's a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of movement. And uh, who who in your uh, draft board do you probably see them going as a as a first round talent? But you know, odds are they might be going in the uh, in the second round. Uh, is there a guy you really like uh, that kind of fits that mold? I think there's a chance Brad Lambert goes in the second round. As crazy as that might sound. It doesn't make, uh, like, it's, yeah. <laughs> it, it's wild, but we've seen it on a couple of recent big boards. I think yeah. from a stake and Craig had him in the, in the second round. And it, it's, it, it'd be wild to me. It would. The tools are yeah. too unreal for, in my opinion, to pass up in the first round. Like, I look at him and I go, man, could I justify taking Connor Geeky in any world uh, ahead of Brad Lambert? And I just can't. Like, I just can't yeah. do it. But I could see him falling to the, to the second round. But the guy that I think really sticks out to me, um, at least on, on the surface, is Noah Ausland. Plays with Sweden at the World Under 18s. It's really dynamic uh, forward, plays center, plays on the wing a little bit. It, he does so much so, so well. And, and you, you see, I think uh, one of the players someone uh, compared him to recently when I was talking about him was Lucas Raymond. And it fits so well. His just ability to kind of drive play from wherever he is on the ice, create something out of nothing, make the pass to the, to the high danger areas and just make the smart play every time and, and show off skill to do it. A, a saucer pass cross ice in transition, like different things that he's able to do, create so much more for his teammates. And there's a lot of players that, are good, but they don't necessarily make their play, their teammates better. And Noah Ellison, is, in my opinion, is a guy that definitely makes his teammates better. And going back to Brad Lambert, I think one of the issues is that a lot of people who aren't prospect junkies or uh, who just look at the stats, they don't realize that, you know, Brad Lambert's line mates also weren't very helpful to his point production. And, and they look at those stat lines and they're like, well, he's not producing. Why would anyone waste a, a high pick on him? And I mean, even today, I heard somebody make that argument about Slavkovsky. They said, well, he hasn't really done much in, in you know, in, in the <laughs> Liga. So it's like, why would you take a guy like that over uh, Logan Cooley? Now, I think, in my opinion, you know, maybe a team like New Jersey does see the value in getting a, a big winger over another center, considering what they have down the middle. We'll see. But, uh, but I think sometimes people just look at those stat lines and they don't actually watch, you know, video of these players and what they can actually bring to the table, which is frustrating sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's always fun to see, and you can kind of pick them out once you've done it for long enough. Where you go, yeah, that's a person who was a, an elite prospect scout, and, and I, I don't mean like a scout from elite prospects. No, they're yeah, very, they're very good, but I mean someone who goes to the elite prospects page and goes, oh yeah, these stats don't add up to being a top <laughs> ten, whatever, or whatever it is, right? Like it, it's funny when you can see a stat sheet scout, and that's probably what I should name it rather than an elite prospect scout before I, get, <laughs> before I get JD or Cam on my ass. Or something. Yeah. Like, I love those guys. But uh, yeah, they, they'd make fun of me for that one. But no, <laughs> and, and there's a lot of guys in this draft that I think are going to have some of that, that effect in them. I think a guy like Gleb Trikazov, there's a lot of people going, well, he's producing in, in Russia. It, it's, it's Russia and that that junior circuit and everything is not is nothing. And they're not wrong, but the, the dynamic skill that this guy has and everything like that, like he should be a first rounder, but for a lot of different reasons, including world turmoil with Russia invading Ukraine, like that throws a wrench into things in terms of getting him over here. So I could see him falling out of the first round too, and being a guy that you, you get top 15 value possibly out of a third round pick. Oh, that would, that would be amazing, but I don't know. Yeah. Ottawa's good with their, their late round picks. That's for sure. So fingers crossed, but, uh, uh, my next question I was going to ask you is who do you believe are the best defensemen and the best forward prospects available outside the first round? Now I'm going to 
put a little caveat that you can't say Brad Lambert because we're just yeah, going to pretend fair. he goes in the first round. <laughs> that's very fair. I think for me, one of the guys that I think is really interesting in the, outside of the first round could be Ty Nelson, uh, the defender from North Bay. He's was in the first round for a lot of lists, but basically since January, February, we've seen him outside the first round on a lot of boards. And even on my own board right now, he's right outside the first round, pretty high in the second round still in, in, in the early thirties. But he's a guy that I think didn't really fit the system that he was in this year. I think some of the coaching decisions on, on that team limited his creativity, limited his, his game because you saw him, his game is to become more conservative as the year went on. And that's not normally how it works. Normally you see the guy get more aggressive, more trusting in his skills and everything. And there was flashes of it certainly late in the year, but it, it just wasn't fully there, but this kid's and, and he's an undersized defenseman as well. So people are going to kind of harp on him for being a five foot eight, five foot nine defenseman, but this kid's built like a tank. He's, he's a jack dude for being such a small guy. It, you see him throw some hits, you see him push guys around in, in, in battle and along the boards and everything. So I think there's, there's something there. And I, I genuinely think he could work out and be a really sneaky, good undersized defenseman. I mean, we've seen Sham Gerard, we've seen Ryan Ellis kind of come in the leagues the last, 10 years and so, and, and do some good things. So it's going to be fun kind of see where his development goes, because if a team lets him play his game, there's the, the ceilings really high for this kid. Uh, as for a forward, I'm going to go with Rucker McGordy as a guy that I think been just outside the first round, just inside the, uh, just inside the first round, just outside the first round. And he's a guy that people don't really seem to know what to, what to do with, because there's some a little bit of skating issues, but at the same time, you see the power at times. You see the stride really improve when he digs in. So it's like, is that just an effort issue? Is that just a motor issue? And, and then you see him sometimes kind of do these goofy little things in transition where he's not really an effective puck carrier by any means. So you watch him in transition. He's skating backwards through the neutral zone, waiting for a pass. And at the NHL level, you're going to get destroyed by a defenseman doing that. And so it's like this guy has a really good shot. He has some really nice off puck movement on the offensive zone. If he works out, like there's a really sneaky, good player, like a David Perron type player in the offensive zone. There, a guy like a uh, Chris or Chris Kreider who just scored 50 goals this year. And I'm not saying Rick and McGrody going to score 50, but he's that kind of player that he can kind of do, make wreck havoc around the net, do a lot of things in the offensive zone. And then you kind of lock outside of that. So it's, it's kind of a, a bit of a one dimensional player in terms of not giving you much defensively and in transition. But if you can get the right mesh and him on, on a line with guys that can cover up for him, that's a really useful player. I think the U S U S national team development program has some excellent, excellent names. Like yes. Rucker McRory, uh, Jimmy Snuggerud, um, uh, Cutter uh, Gauthier. Cutter Gauthier. The, like the list goes on. Uh, and I, I really appreciate that about them. Logan um, Sheamus's, two Sheamus's, yeah, Seamus Casey that, and Seamus Powell, Isaac it's, uh, Howard, it's, yeah, and, and uh, he that, goes by that, Ike, so it's Ike okay, Howard. All right, <laughs> there we go, yeah, there like, we go. Even better, they call him the Ice it's, Man. Like it's oh, almost it's like the WHL draft. It's like oh. how many Ryden, Bradens, and yeah, and, uh, true. like it, it gets ridiculous. Oh, it's uh, so funny during the World of Under 18, uh, Graydon Seatman, uh, player for the Moose Jaw or not Moose Jaw, Swift Current uh, Broncos, uh, scored a big goal for Canada. And, and I tweeted out, uh, oh, Braden Seatman, and it just kind of my autocorrect on my phone went autocorrected Graydon to Braden because, yeah, why would it be Graydon? But because it's a WHL kid, instantly I got a message from my buddy Joel Henderson, who you guys may know and who follows the WHL and one yeah. of the best scouts in the WHL publicly. And he he immediately goes, Tony, it's Graydon. And I'm like, Yeah, I know. He goes, You you wrote Braden. And I'm like, my autocorrect. And <laughs> of course he started razzing me about it, written me about it and stuff. And it's like, man, like the Graydon, Braden. Aiden, the WHL is crazy. Raiden, they get rid of everything oh. before it. It's literally just <laughs> yeah, Raiden. There's, there's also a Raison. A Raison. Yes. yes. Oh, there's oh so God. many in the WHL. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it, it's like it's like BC moms are just like going at it. They want to yeah. up one up each other. I love it. Um, so uh, we we've had quite a few prospect um analysts come on the podcast and everybody like has one guy that they love like um last year will scouts loved uh marco rossi oh no wait that was 2020 sorry yeah 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 Yeah. uh well no in that draft he loved he loved uh russian kid oh 
Uh, Murat Kuznadinov. Yes, he liked, it yes, was Murat, Murat yes. Kuznadinov. Like, he went to bat for him every single time. So I got to ask, in this draft, <laughs> who, who do you love? Who is my guy? Uh, Frank Nazar has been my guy for most of the year. Uh, he's a guy I've kept in the top seven kind of all year. I had him at four at one point. He's a guy that just has so much to his game. I've called him controlled chaos so many times because you never know what he's going to be like. You ever see that those vines or the tick or not vines. Jeez. I'm old. Uh, the, the TikToks or the, the Instagram reels where it's like, never show them what your next move is. And it's just people doing dumb shit. That's literally Frank Nazar on the ice. Every single time he plays the game of hockey, it's insane. Like you never know. What he, I don't think he knows what he's going to do. He's so incredibly adaptive to the environment. And like, he just has so much skill and plays with at such a high pace. And I love guys that play with high pace. Uh, I think Frank Nazar is going to be a stud and, You've seen him low on some of the recent kind of goofy boards that have come out, including yeah. Central Scouting's board, where they had him yeah. 21 among North American skaters. Yeah. And if, if you can get him at 21, let alone what that would put him at, including the Europeans, like it'd be a 30. If you can get him somewhere in that range, you're laughing. You're absolutely laughing at this draft because like Fabian Lysel last year, I think every tool that you wanted to see is there. It's just put it together, let him, let him give him time to develop and, and show that patience. And you're going to get a player that plays a high octane brand of hockey that you're just going to love. And he's going to put butts in seats. I'm honestly really surprised to see Nazar lower down too in some of these draft boards, because to me, he's this year's Ken Johnson. Like he's that guy who is almost like a, you know, a video game. Yeah. Uh, that's what I know. Will sketch described uh, Ken Johnson as last year. He's like a video game player. Like he's, you know, the, the things he does on the ice with the puck are really cool. And he's really dynamic. Um, his skating, the way he pivots and is elusive is really fun to watch. And yeah, it kind of surprises me. And I'm wondering, is it because he's not the tallest guy? Like I know he's about listed at like five ten, I believe. Yeah. He's like five, nine and a half, five ten. I think that kind of plays into it. Also. I think there is a lot of people that are like, is this a center? Is this a winger? Um, you look at his game and it could project to either, in my opinion. And, and I know there's been a few people, including himself, I think in a recent interview that said he wants to be like Patrice Bergeron. And I, I look, I just look at his game and I go, dude, you have way too much pace, way too much like, and this is nothing against Patrice Bergeron, but no. way too much skill to play that style of game. Patrice Bergeron is this methodical, absolute mastermind on the ice. And, and Frank Nazar is this absolute controlled ball of dust, Tasmanian devil up and down the ice just creating havoc everywhere. And I think he does a really good job defensively when he's engaged. And I think he, he's an incredibly creative player offensively. So it, it's going to be interesting to see where he goes because man, the, this kid's got a ton of, ton of fun in his game. Bergeron is like the most buzz name. If you're a center yeah. as a prospect, like I, I model it. my game after Patrice Bergeron. It's <laughs> like, okay, well, I I've seen you play. I know yeah. that you're not Patrice Bergeron. Or like any, uh, sorry, I was going to say any like steady biggish defenseman. It's like Hedman. Hed yeah. That guy's Hedman. It, it's so crazy to me because I look at Patrice Bergeron specifically and I don't think he gets the credit he deserves, but we, we look at Crosby, look at McDavid, even Matthews somewhat now. And we're like Ovechkin and you're like, oh, these are generational talents. And, yeah. and I don't think Patrice Bergeron gets the love for that. But when you look at his defensive metrics over the last 15, 20 years, basically, as long as he's been in the league, this guy's a legitimate generational talent. And yeah, he only scored, he only scores 80 points in the season sometimes or 70 points in the season. But the dude is an unreal shot suppressor, an unreal he, offense killer that I, I, in my love. opinion, he's in that same range level. He, he got the love that Jonathan, or he didn't get the love that Jonathan Taves did get. Yes. 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 And 100%. like Jonathan Taves has never been as good as Patrice Bergeron in his prime. Like nope. they, it was always so annoying just watching Chicago and people being like, oh, Jonathan Taves is the second best player in the league. It's like, no, he's not even the best player on his own team. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. So Patrice Bergeron gets gets the love. And I remember when we drafted Colin White and that was the thing, yeah. like Colin White <laughs> is going to be this Patrice, Patrice Bergeron light. And I was like, listen, if we get, 50% of Patrice Bergeron in you, you'll be a hell of a player. Narrator. The, they did the, not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> then what record happened? scratch. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, the only player I look at in the last few, like I, I've been doing this for five drafts, four or five drafts now, <clears throat> at least at the level I'm kind of doing it now. And the only player I've ever 
realistically felt comfortable comparing to Patrice Bergeron is Anton Lindell. And I think we saw mm-hmm. that this year with his rookie season where he was such an incredible goal scorer and also an absolute two-way menace. So I, I think he's the only prospect I've seen, including Shane Wright. Like we look at Shane Wright and there's a lot of people that go, this is Patrice Bergeron coming <laughs> yeah. up. And I'm like, he wears black and gold, but no. Um, like it, it's, it's crazy to me that people get to that comparison so much. And, and that's why with Shane Wright and guys like that, I've gone, no, Ryan O'Reilly. That's a really outstanding two-way center still. Yeah. But it's not Patrice Bergeron. Like, I just the Tim Hortons incident. Yeah, the Tim Hortons incident. (laughs) That that happened. Just keep Shane right away from Timmy's. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know if you want to ask uh, um, Tony about any more prospects, but I'll I'll go Uh, with another one. There there is uh, one guy um, who recently just like tore up the U18s, and I think he won the MVP. It was Yuri Kulik or Kulich. Yeah, Yeah, Kulich. Yeah. What's, What's his deal? (laughs) <laughs> where did he really come good. from <laughs> he comes from the check uh it, it, it's he's a guy that i had in my top i had him at 21 um and, and right now he's currently at 19 uh but i had him at 21 back in november um or december when i put my, my mid-season ranking out and it he's a guy that has all this offensive talent he's got a really good shot loves to play the game at a pretty high pace but as we kind of saw at the under 18s a lot of his game relies on the power play. A lot of his game relies on his teammates kind of helping him out. And I thought Edward Saleh did a really good job at the, the U18s doing that. And, and I think Yuri Kulich is an excellent, excellent trigger man. A guy that you look at and you're like, man, he could score 30 and 30 in a season and you wouldn't be shocked at all. And, and I think that he's a really valuable two-way guy. Or yeah, two-way guy. He plays a pretty solid defensive game as well. So he's a, a really interesting prospect. Plays in the Czech Republic, so no one saw him until the World Under 18s, unfortunately, basically. Um, but now, yeah, you're seeing him shoot up boards and everything, and it's it's really fun to watch. But I, I will preface it with almost all of his – I think all of his production except for one point came on the power play at the U18. Got so it. there is a little bit of kind of caution in the wind for that. But this guy it does have the talent to do it at 5-on-5 five five as well. It's just he, he was on the power play a lot. Now, there's – Ottawa. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, if Ottawa does end up drafting with this draft pick, I wouldn't be surprised if they did end up trading down because really? it sounds like there's a lot of like a lot of got, I mean, Brad Lambert is said <laughs> to be going in the second round in some places. Like imagine if Pierre Dorian was like, <laughs> I've finally <laughs> evolved and he oh. goes God <laughs> mode and picks everything that everybody wanted him to. Pick. It's not going to happen. Like that's a lot of credit where it's probably not due, but that'd be kind of <laughs> yeah, sick. Like they could have had <laughs> Atu Rati or Ratu and um, Logan Stankoven last year. And yeah. uh, they instead they have Zach Austin, Chuck and Ben Roger. You know what? Austin Chuck had really Aust- made strides yeah. in the second half of the season, but I mean, yeah. Ben Rogers. <laughs> ben Rogers of fame. He is a player. Yes. Guys, hey, don't hate on good old Ben. He is he might a guy listen, so like who thanks for listening, Ben Ryan. Hockey. We appreciate you. <laughs> and hopefully he gets it there because I, I root for every guy. All right. Yes, He's the guys yeah. like, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I root for the guy that's picked last in the draft just to start as I root for the guy picked first. It's just kind of when you're doing evaluations, you gotta be a little stingy and you got to go okay i like this guy over this guy and stuff and you know what at the end of the day the better best stories are always the guys that come from from nowhere come from being undrafted or drafted late because those are always way funner to hear about all right so tony another guy i wanted to ask you about because he seems to be controversial i'm a little higher on him than some people but cutter gothier some people have him inside the top 10 some have him outside the top 10 what do you think about his game I think Cody Gochi is a really interesting player. I don't know if he projects as a center. I know he filled in at center uh, over the world juniors when Logan Cooley was out. He did, he did a pretty good job then, but I think he kind of projects as a winger who does a lot of things really well, but doesn't really have a super big standout trait. I think he's got a really good shot and that's probably the thing that'll get him uh, paid in the NHL. But this is a guy that kind of works and does a lot of things really good from in tight gets to the right spots. You don't have to worry about him being out of position in the offensive zone or on breakouts and everything. He's a guy that you just rely on. And I think the, the, his kind of flexibility within that NTDP lineup showed that. And whether he's playing on the left wing, the right wing center up and down the lineup, first line, third line, wherever they asked him to play, he was able to fill in that role and exceed expectations. So he's a guy that I, I have right now currently at 16. I think 
that's a decent spot for him. But if a team gr- jumps up and grabs him at say nine, 10, I'm, I'm not going to be shocked. I think seven's probably a little high. It wouldn't be a Tyler Boucher reach, but it would probably be a little bit of a reach. Well, that's, that's not bad then. I think <laughs> like I can, I can, I can stomach I'll, I'll that. Life, that reach. Yeah. Life of a sentence fan. Ah, you know, I reach from 17 to seven. It wasn't that. I, I, I've told this story like a couple times, but when they picked Tyler Boucher, I was at a cottage. I was drunk with my friends and they were like, and the Ottawa Senators select Tyler Boucher. And I DM'd Will Scouch and I was like, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. And he was, was like, eh. <laughs> yeah, it was so oh. funny. Cause I was, I'm, I'm in a group chat with Will and a few other people uh, uh, kind of do the same work. And uh, it was so funny when that happened because all, all of a sudden the group chat lit up and we're all like, uh guys tyler boucher really like and then of course will doing what will does he goes i'm I'm gonna go watch some games because uh <laughs> i need to see what what i missed and then and then i remember like later that night we're all sitting around talking a little bit after things had calmed down and the 45 hour draft had finished and <laughs> we were like so you watch more tyler boucher and he goes yeah i'm like so did i <laughs> like, did, did, did you see it he's like no did you i'm like no no i didn't like i don't Good player. I thought he should have gone in the second round, probably. But yeah, that was a, a bit of a rough pick. Yeah, and I remember and he was a great kid too. Yeah, and like yeah. honestly, I want him to succeed. I would never yeah. want a prospect to not succeed, uh, especially one drafted by my organization or <laughs> mine. Uh, you know, I own them now. But uh, yes, that's, uh, that's the natural progression. Of <laughs> but no, it, with that, it was it was just so surprising because well, I mean, I don't need to say why we everyone has talked about that last year i'll move on um but for myself like i I went and watched albeit one game so very very small sample size but he barely moves his feet if he's not involved in the play and that worries me i want a guy to at least be involved in the play they don't have to be the best guy ever but i just want to see some some movement and see some like effort and stuff and and i'm again criticizing effort maybe isn't the best thing but move your feet is what I'm just trying to say. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think the big thing with him too, the, especially this year, I think, I think possibly the pressure had gotten to him a little bit. There's a lot of people talking about him. It, it's not like it's just an Ottawa Senators fan base talking about him. It was everyone because of how yeah. big of a reach it was. I think he's a perfectly good player and he was set to go to Boston college and then didn't or Boston university. Sorry, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it didn't work out quite the way he hoped it would. So he went to the Ottawa 67s and, and I, and I think that was kind of a, a shock to the system where he's like, Oh, the OHL is a little bit better than I was expecting it to be. And, and now I think next year is going to be the first year. We're really going to get to see what, what Tyler Boucher can do because there's a good player in there. There, he has a lot of tools that you'd like to see. He has some projectable skill that you, you want to see in the NHL. And if he can get them some, some things together and kind of, like you said, move his feet a little bit more, kind of play a little bit of a higher pace. There's a really decent power for it that I could play in the middle of six. So I, I'm rooting for the kid. I certainly am because I'd love to see him figure it out because this is a guy that was drafted really high and the Ottawa centers need their high picks to work out. So if, if the Ottawa centers are going to get somewhere, Tyler Boucher hopefully is going to be a part of that. Matt, I don't know if you have anybody else you want to ask, but I have one more question and then that's all you okay. man. Yeah. Tony, we'll ask you one more and we'll call it a night. Um, I was going to ask outside of, of Nemich and your check, who do you think is the next defenseman off the board? That's really interesting. I think a guy like Seamus Casey's interesting, but he's fallen down the board a lot because I don't think he produced as much as people were expecting him to, to this year. My next defenseman on my board personally is Kevin Korczynski from the WHL plays for Seattle. Uh, this guy's an, a beast in transition. He's a guy that understands the game at, in the offensive zone and defensive zone positioning wise. He, he really loves to play with the puck and be dynamic and escape out of the pockets and escape into the space in the defensive zone and, and make a good first pass. I think he's really, really kind of showing the showcasing the, the prototypical modern day defenseman that can play at both ends of the ice and do a lot of things. Well, he needs to get a little bit more physical, probably going up to the NHL level and stuff, but that'll come with physical maturity. I think he's a guy that I think does a lot of things really positively in the modern game. You're not going to get this guy that's a bone cruncher killing guys along the boards. This that, and the other thing going to get a guy that kind of guides a guy to the outside, uses a stick to disrupt the play and then jump onto the puck rather than leaving the puck for a teammate to get, he gets the puck himself and works it up ice. And I think that's a really 
good trait to have in today's modern NHL. So for me, it's Kevin Korczynski uh, from the Seattle Thunderbirds. Awesome. Uh, well, on that note, uh, thanks again so much for joining us. We love talking prospects, like I said. Uh, did you want to plug anything of your own before you, you head off? Uh, you can go to hockeynews.com and check out any of my stuff there. I'm doing a few couple of prospect pieces for the World Cup, uh, World Championship coming up. Uh, just some draft draft eligible guys that are uh, that are going to be out there to watch for. Uh, Juracek, uh, Nemec is going to be there. A few other guys, uh, Slavkovsky included. And then a, a piece on some uh, drafted prospects, prospects that are already in, in organizations that'll be there as well, kind of showcasing their skill. And hopefully they can make the jump to, to being full-time NHLers next year. So those are the kind of what's going on the thing now. And, and then there's always the game tape with Tony videos where I interview guys and kind of break down some tape with them, which is always fun kind of seeing what they see on the ice. Cool. Uh, and uh, are you releasing your uh, your draft board, your updated one? Yes, my board will be out in early January, early early January. Jeez, <laughs> going to say uh, we're going back in time. Yeah, just, uh, I'm going to be really late on my board this year, guys. Uh, <laughs> months after the draft, uh, no, early June I'll be releasing my final board, and uh, there'll be a full write up on the top 100 probably. So it'll be tons of Ooh. tons of stuff to go into, and, and hopefully they'll help prep some people for the draft. Awesome, and I'm nerding out on that for yeah, sure, definitely. All right, well, uh, thanks again for joining us. Enjoy the playoffs, and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, anytime, boys. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. Thanks. Thanks.